Hello everyone. Uh, I guess the uh, next uh, Ronggui is going to tell us about uh, explaining landscape connectivity of low-cost solutions for multi-layer <coughs> new networks. Okay. Uh, thanks for coming and thanks for inviting me. Today I'm going to talk about uh, this very interesting phenomena of landscape connectivity. Uh, so this is uh, joint work with many people, mostly because I got really in, uh, excited about the project and uh, I told many people about it. Uh, so it's uh, with uh, Rohis and Xiang uh, from Duke and Holden, Yi, Zhiyuan, Wei, and Sanjeev uh, from Princeton. Um, okay, so, uh, so first, what is this landscape connectivity property that I'm talking about? Well, this is a phenomenon, uh, also known as mode connectivity, that has been discovered in many uh, recent papers. Uh, so roughly speaking, this is the property uh, of some neural network solutions. So for neural networks, local minima that are found by doing gradient descent or other popular optimization algorithms uh, are actually found to be connected by simple paths in the parameter space. And uh, by connected by simple paths, I mean uh, the property of the path is that every point on the path is another solution or another parameter of neural networks that have almost the same cost as the two endpoints. Uh, so here, uh, this is a uh, picture uh, representing this phenomena. This comes from one of the papers uh, by Garupov et al. So, so here, uh, we have uh, solutions A and B. <coughs> so think of these as two uh, minimizers that you find by randomly initializing the neural network at two independently random locations. And you run gradient descent, or SGD, and you find these two solutions, A and B. They both have uh, lower cost. So in this figure, the warmer colors uh, represent lower cost, and the colder colors represent high cost. As you can see, if I look at just these two solutions, A and B, and if I try to do a direct interpolation between A and B, then uh, it actually goes through an energy barrier, right? Uh, in the middle of this line, uh, the cost is actually very high. Uh, on the other hand, uh, that actually is not true for every path that's connecting A and B. In particular, in this paper, they are able to find this path uh, by introducing this additional point C in, in between. And if you look at uh, the path from A to C and then from C to B, then the entire path lies in this red region, and, and the red region is the region with the lowest cost, right? Um, so uh, these paths can be so simple that it's just two line segments, or uh, in the paper they also uh, use other simple curves like a basal curve. So, uh, you, can, you can find these paths fairly consistently for many architectures of neural networks. Uh, and that's, that's a very surprising phenomenon when I first learned about it. So in this talk, I'm first going to explain why I was actually super surprised uh, when I learned about this, and maybe why you should also be a little bit surprised. Uh, and then I will talk about our results, which uh, shows that local minimum, a, a certain type of local minimum, are actually connected by paths. And towards the end, I will talk about what, what does this mean, right? How can we use this property uh, as an open problem? OK, so as a background, I, I was really surprised by this result because I was working on these non-convex optimization and uh, optimization landscape. So uh, in the past few years, me and many collaborators and many other researchers we're able to prove that many non-convex objectives satisfy what I will call the locally optimizable property. So what is this property? For these functions, all local minima are actually globally optimal. Uh, as in this function, as you can see, there are two equivalent uh, local and global optimal solutions. And these uh, objectives also don't have any high order saddle points. And because of these, uh, there are uh, a lot of algorithms, including gradient descent, but there are many other algorithms that can be guaranteed to find a local minimum very efficiently for these functions. And because of the first property, that is also a global optimal solution. So that kind of explains why local search algorithms can optimize some of the non-convex functions. Uh, so when we are doing these kind of work, uh, the objective functions that uh, we and uh, many other researchers were able to prove uh, mostly fall into two categories, I would say. Uh, so one category are 
what I will call the matrix problems. So these are problems like matrix sensing, matrix sensation, and every problem where you are trying to find a low rank matrix. Okay. Um, there are many ways to solve the problem, but in the non-convex approach, if you want to find a low rank matrix, you will actually explicitly write this low rank matrix M as the product of two smaller matrices. So this guarantees the rank is small. Here I'm, of course, looking at the simpler case where M is also a symmetric PSD, but uh, it, um, there are also results for more general asymmetric matrices. Uh, so an important uh, property of this type of problem is we only care about the final matrix M. I don't actually care about these factors X. So as long as I get a factor X that gives me the same low rank matrix M, I'm actually very happy. So this uh, is kind of a symmetry within the non-convex objective, and this gives a lot of equivalent solutions. So if X star is an optimal solution, then I can uh, right multiply X star with a matrix R. Uh, R is a uh, orthonormal matrix. Uh, so if I do that, uh, then XX transpose will not change, and that's why all of these solutions are equivalent as they give the same matrix. Right? Uh, in contrast to the matrix problems, there's another class of problems that I'm going to call tensor problems, but these are not all uh, tensor decomposition problems. Uh, these are all the problems where you are trying to find k different components. So these can be k components in a tensor decomposition, but for uh, those who are not familiar with tensor decomposition, you can also think of these as, say, k centers of uh, clusterings or k neurons in a two-layer neural network. So it's just you are trying to find k vectors that are different, okay? Um, and in, th in these kind of problems, it doesn't really matter what I call, uh, which one I call the first vector, which one I call the second vector, which one I call the third vector, as long as the set of vectors is the same, the solution is the same, okay? So because of that symmetry, we again have many equivalent solutions. Uh, so here, if x star, uh, is an optimal solution, so, so think of the columns of x star as the vectors that we are looking for, then I can write multiply x star with a permutation matrix. Uh, so that basically gives the same set of column vectors and that is the same solution. So the reason why these two problems are very different is because they have very different symmetry, right? And uh, because of these symmetries, I have always had the intuition that the matrix problems uh, they will have mostly connected local minimum, right? Because the set of orthonormal matrices uh, is mostly connected. I say mostly because it does have two connected components, one with uh, determinant one, one with determinant minus one. Uh, so that's why I think the picture is going to look like that uh, for matrix problems. <coughs> On the other hand, for the tensor problems, because permutations are very discrete objects, so I always have the idea that for these uh, tensor problems, or including actually uh, neural networks, they will have isolated local minimum. So uh, this picture looks quite different from the connected local minimum picture <laughs> that we actually saw for, for neural networks in practice, right? So that's why I was uh, super surprised when I learned that neural network solutions are actually connected. Um, the reason is uh, neural networks, uh, I thought, only have permutation symmetry. So why do they uh, actually have connected local minimum, right? Uh, well, there's a short uh, but partial answer to that. Uh, and the answer has been, uh, this has been an answer to many problems uh, that have been mentioned in this workshop, right? So the partial short answer is because of our prime transition, right? Uh, we are not trying to train a neural network with exactly the smallest number of neurons that's possible. We are, in, in practice, we probably uh, over parameterize by uh, trying to learn a neural network with many more neurons. And because of that, the landscape is going to change significantly. And indeed, this was an explanation of this mode connectivity phenomena in uh, many of the existing works. So a short summary of this work is that if the network has special structure, so it's either two-layer or it's multi-layer but has uh, some special structures, and if the network is very over-parameterized, by over, very over-parameterized, I mean the number of neurons is larger than the number of training samples, then they can show all the local minimum are actually connected. Uh, so 
uh, of course, this uh, very over parameterized regime is kind of similar to the NTK regime that has been mentioned uh, several times in this uh, workshop. And it's actually slightly better in the, in the sense that you just need number of neurons to be bigger than the number of training samples. You don't need a polynomial factor there. Uh, but still, uh, it's, arguably, uh, it's arguable whether, this, whether the neural networks that we actually use are very over parameterized. It's always the case that the number of parameters is much larger than the number of training samples, or very often the case. But it's very often not the case that the number of neurons is actually larger than the number of training samples. And especially when you actually consider convolutional neural networks, some of these results require the number of channels uh, to be larger than the training samples. And that's definitely not true. Okay, so bottom line is um, uh, all of these analyses are very nice. Uh, but uh, in practice, networks are not as over-parameterized as these theories uh, require. Uh, but even though the networks are not as over-parameterized, in practice, people were still able to find these paths that are connecting different local minima. So that's why I'm saying this is just a partial answer. And in our result, we, we give another partial answer. Uh, I, of course, I'm not going to claim that uh, even taking the union of these two partial answers are going to explain entirely the mode connectivity phenomena, but we give another uh, regime where this can be proved. Okay, so what do we prove? So we first actually give a lower bound that says for neural networks, not all local or global minima are connected, even in the over parameterized setting. Okay, so this might sound contradicting uh, to the uh, existing result uh, question. Is the mode connectivity been demonstrated um, for like random data? Uh, so, oh. is there any reason to believe a priori that this is a property, a general property of neural networks? Um, oh, that's a good versus, question. Uh, Right, so, so the question is whether mode connectivity has been demonstrated for random data. So, uh, we haven't done the experiment. Uh, on the other hand, um, so the previous result that requires a very over parameterized setting, so those proofs are actually, uh, do not depend anything on the data distribution. So in those regimes, no matter what your data is, including random data, you will have mode connectivity. But then for the practical regimes, for the actual- For the practical uh, regimes, we, we haven't tried, so, so I don't know. It, it's possible that it may not work. Well, our theory definitely suggests that it would not work when you have random things, but, but uh, we haven't tried that. Okay. okay, so yeah, so first we actually talk about uh, even in the over parameterized setting, not all local min are connected. Uh, while this might sound uh, that it's contradicting with previous result, I will explain why they are not. Uh, and since not all local min are, are connected, we think we actually focus on a special type of uh, solutions. Uh, in particular, we show that solutions that satisfy what we are going to define as dropout stability are actually connected by simple paths. Uh, and we can also switch dropout connect, uh, stability uh, with some other notions of stability, such as noise stability, that were used before for proving generalization <coughs> bounds for neural networks. Okay, so uh, before getting into the actual result, let, let me just first uh, uh, get into the notation of neural networks to make sure we are on the same page. Uh, so for simplicity, we will only consider fully connected uh, networks uh, for this talk. Uh, and we think of the weights, uh, we use theta to represent all the parameters of the neural network, uh, which in this simple setting is just going to be all the weight matrices. And the network is going to have nonlinearity sigma, and for, for this talk, just think of sigma as the standard gradual. Uh, so we have samples X and Y, and we are hoping to learn a network that maps X to Y. Uh, the network uh, just works as normal. Uh, so the function computed by the network, uh, F of theta applied to X, is just recursively multiplying with the ma weight matrix and apply the nonlinearity. Uh, one thing that's important here uh, is that the last layer uh, is not followed by a nonlinearity, right? So the output is a linear function in the previous layer. Uh, so the objective uh, L of theta is defined uh, as the empirical loss. So all of these phenomena that I talked about 
uh, the mode connectivity they are with respect to the empirical loss. Uh, so in practice, people did find that if you just try to connect two random solutions, then the test error uh, along the path is also good, but, but that's even more mysterious. Um, okay, so th that's why I'm defining the objective here as the empirical loss, uh, and here is this L. Uh, it's just any convex loss function. It's just this small function L is convex. Of course, the whole objective is not convex. So think of L as just some standard losses such as d squares uh, or uh, cross entropy. Okay, so that's the neural network that we are going to consider. Uh, so first, uh, about the lower bound. So what we are able to show is even in a very simple setting, uh, not all local or global minimum are connected. So the simple setting is that we just have a two-layer neural network. Uh, so it's just input, output, and one hidden layer. A question? Could you define very precisely what do you mean by connected? So do you mean that the A and B have the same objective value and the entire path has the same value? Or when you have two local minima with different value, what do you mean by connected? Ah, that's right. So, so, in, this, uh, so in this talk, we are going to, uh, yeah, so uh, by connected, I mean uh, if you have two solutions, A and B, uh, and if they have the same objective value, then uh, the path needs to have a lower objective value than both. Or uh, we can relax that to say you can have slightly higher objective, but not much higher than both. Uh, if they have different objective value, then anything in, in the path just needs to be less or equal to the, uh, the larger one of the two. Uh, more questions? So this is a real local minima. They don't have to be global. Sorry? In, uh, in this, your local minima don't have to be global. Oh, right. Uh, well, so in this lower bound result, uh, actually the local min that we talk about will have zero loss. So they are all uh, global minima. OK, so, so uh, the setting is simple because we are, we are going to have data sets that are generated by a ground truth neural network. And the ground truth neural network is actually very small. It just has two hidden neurons. And we are going to consider over parameter transition. So we consider the optimization of a two-layer neural network with h hidden neurons. And h can potentially be much, much larger compared to 2. So what we are able to prove there is for any h, there exists a data set with h plus 2 samples, such that the set of global minimizers are not connected. So there exist two global minimizers. <laughs> that if you want to go from one to the other, you will have to leave uh, the place where, uh, like you will have a point that ha does not have zero loss. Uh, so what's important here, and the reason that why that's not contradicting with the previous result, is we have H plus two samples on the H uh, neuron uh, network. So this is not in the very over parameterized regime. The number of uh, samples, training samples, is larger than the number of neurons. On the other hand, this is still, I mean, I mean in practice, you would still call this over parameterized because this network has older H neurons, let's say F5H, uh, where co uh, constant times H neurons. And that's actually larger than the, uh, uh, sorry, constant times H parameters. And uh, the number of parameters is definitely larger than the number of samples. Uh, you're considering a binary classification problem. Uh, well, here, uh, well, I'm actually considering even a least squares loss. So, uh, uh, yeah, a regression kind of problem. Uh, but uh, the result can actually be generalized to other loss function. Uh, no, but what if you have more? Oh, 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 sorry. Uh, yeah, so this is just a single output. For simple cases, can you provide a mapping from one global minimizer to another in your parameter space? Uh, what do you mean by a mapping? We can so a function that takes you from one set of parameters to the global minima. So one set of parameters at one global minima to the other set of parameters at the other global minima. So one example would be like some permutation symmetry on your parameters. You just look. Right, so, so in this case, the two uh, global minimizers we uh, consider, they are not permutations of each other. So they are uh, fairly distinct global minimizers. If you have enough neurons, can't you just literally copy one minimizer, copy the other minimizer, and then interpolate between them by setting various weights equal to zero? Oh, that's a very good question. So uh, yeah, I mean, if I'm allowed 
to increase the width of the network by a factor of two, <laughs> then, then I can always connect things. And in fact, that's going to be a key intuition in the proof that I'm going to show you later. But if you are not, uh, well, the, this result is saying if you are not allowed to modify the architecture, right? You are not allowed to make your layers wider, then it's not clear how you can manipulate within the limited number of neurons to connect things. Okay, so let's go on. So, so now that we know maybe not all lo local or global minimizers are connected, what kind of them are connected? Well, uh, so the empirical results are strong, but they are not really saying that all local min are connected, right? Because we, we cannot really find all the local minimum or all the global minimum of a neural network. <laughs> So the empirical results are only saying that local minimum found by standard optimization algorithms such as SGD, uh, so these are known to be connected. Other things, uh, they might also be connected, but we, we are not sure, right? So does this uh, local minimum uh, have some nice property? Well, they surely do, but unfortunately we don't have a very clean characterization of what properties they should satisfy, right? So the property of local mean that's found by standard optimization algorithm is a very interesting problem. It's closely connected to the problem of generalization because if we know all of them have some special property, we probably can use those properties to prove better generalization bounds. And of course, this is uh, related to implicit regularization. Uh, if we know what properties they, they have, that might be an effect of implicit regularization because of these popular optimization algorithms, right? Uh, and there are many conjectures. Um, I, I'm not going to be able to list all of them. For example, there are conjectures that local min uh, found in practice are flat in some sense. The exact definition of flat uh, is not entirely clear. Uh, and uh, there are also conjectures that local minimum found in practice have large margin, as, as Matus and Jason talked about. Uh, again, the exact definition of margin in the neural network setting uh, is, up, is debatable, uh, like which, which version do you use? Um, so there are many conjectures, but for this talk, we are actually going to focus on a simple uh, definition that we are call, uh, going to call dropout stability. So what is dropout stability? So we say a network is epsilon dropout stable if zeroing out 50% of nodes at every layer, and of course you are allowed to rescale the output of other neurons that are remaining. So if doing these kind of things increases its loss by at most epsilon. So just in picture, uh, this is a say three layer neural network. Uh, the dropout version will look like this. Of course, in general, you don't necessarily want to drop out all the right half of the neurons, but we are just going to permute things so that it looks like this. Question? Uh, you mean zeroing out a random 50% of neurons? Right, uh, good, I'm, I'm going to get to that. So, uh, so of course, dropout stability is related to dropout training. So in, if you are doing dropout training, you would zero out a random 50% fraction. But what we are actually assuming here uh, is a different version of that where we only require you to, uh, we only require there exist 50% of neurons. Uh, and when you zero out those neurons, uh, the loss of the uh, uh, neural network does not increase by too much. <coughs> so in some sense, this is a weaker requirement than robustness to dropout training because we only require an existential result. Uh, Does the 50% potentially depend upon the example being fed through? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? Does the 50%, is the 50% independent of the example that you are? Well, this is just saying on the training set. Okay. So, so this is talking about the loss, right? and the loss here is the so empirical so loss. So, so 50% is over the entire training set. <laughs> like it's the same uh, you, you, you drop out, you remove the same 50% of the nodes, uh, throughout the entire training set. Uh, and for technical reasons, we actually uh, not only require these two networks have uh, low loss, we also require if you drop out only the top layer or like uh, consecutively the top few layers, uh, it also has <coughs> low loss. Okay, so what we are going to be able to prove is if both sets of parameters are epsilon dropout stable, then we can uh, show that there exists a path between them uh, and the maximum loss on any point of the path 
is upper bounded by the maximum loss of the two endpoints plus epsilon, where epsilon is the epsilon in the dropout stability uh, property. So the proof of this theorem is actually very simple. So I'm going to be able to show you almost the entire proof. Uh, so, uh, so to do that, let me first uh, give you some uh, high level intuition uh, of how are, are we doing, trying to connect things. So here I have two networks, right? Uh, so, so these different patterns represent, they have different weights. Um, so the high level intuition is in order to connect them, I will first connect the first network to its dropout version. Uh, uh, similarly, I will also connect the second network with its dropout version. Uh, so now the good thing is both networks now only have half of the capacity as before. Uh, so actually, I can put these two networks side by side uh, like this. Okay, so in this case, I'm putting these two networks side by side. So there's no cross connections between the two networks. So the outputs here are exactly the same as the output for both of the previous, uh, for, for these two networks. So as long as I do a linear combination of these two outputs, uh, I'm still going to be pr uh, producing good output. And, and that is why convexity of the out, uh, objective function with respect to the output of the neural network. So, so at a high level, these two smaller networks that only have half of the neurons, it's very easy to connect them. So the really hard step, uh, or the harder step, uh, is how do we connect a neural network with its dropout version? Uh, so of course, the first naive attempt is maybe we can try to do a direct interpolation. Uh, direct interpolation uh, usually doesn't work in general. Uh, so let's even look at a simple case where you have a two-layer linear network. Even in that case, uh, direct interpolation in many cases does not work. So if the first network is, has parameters u1, w1, the second network has parameters u2, w2, and if we try to interpolate between these parameters with coefficient alpha and one minus alpha, what happens is the final uh, functions that we compute is going to look like this. So it has uh, these three terms. So the first term is going to be exactly the matrix that you are computing for the first set of parameters. So the last term is going to be the uh, matrix that you are computing using the second set of parameters. But unfortunately, there's also this intermediate term, which as you can see has u1 transpose w2 and u2 transpose w1. So it's a mixture of the two networks. Uh, so as uh, Sanjeev said, this remin is reminiscent of uh, a centaur, which is uh, half a human, half a horse. So in general, uh, I mean, we don't know what are the properties of these uh, centaur-like terms. Uh, if u and w are just fairly arbitrary, then they are not going to do anything good, right? So in general, this will have high cost. I have a star here because uh, it's, it, with stronger assumptions, it is actually possible to do direct interpolation between a network and its dropout version. Uh, it's just not possible to do direct interpolation uh, between a network and another totally unrelated network. Uh, so uh, without stronger assumption, we cannot do direct interpolation. So how can we connect a network with its dropout version? Uh, so here's the uh, main observation. So we are going to use uh, several line segments to try to connect them, and we can use two types of line segments, okay? So we will say uh, it's a type A segment. If the two endpoints, theta A and theta B, both have low loss, and they only differ in top layer weight, okay? So all the, previer, uh, all the previous layers have the same weight. Uh, it's only the top layers that are different. In this case, we can linearly interpolate between them because the loss function is actually convex in the top layer weight. Uh, oh, sorry. So in a type B uh, line segment, it's going to be, uh, well, of course, just having type A uh, segments is not going to be enough because we can only change the top layer weights, right? In order to change other layer weights, we rely on this type B move, which says if a group of neurons uh, does not have any outgoing edges, right? They, are, they do not have any outgoing connections. 
then we can change their incoming edges arbitrarily because anyway, they are not doing anything, right? So changing their incoming edges does not change the output. Uh, so the main idea is we are going to recurse from the top layer. We are going to alternate between these type A and type B moves. And type B moves are going to prepare us for the next type A move. Uh, so here's actually a pass for a three layer network. Uh, don't actually look at the pass. Uh, I, I will go through the pass uh, step by step. Uh, what's important in this slide is actually uh, for these three weight matrices, uh, this is W3, the top layer weight, this is W2, the middle layer weight, and this is the bottom layer weight. We're going to uh, uh, factorize, our, not factorize, but we are going to partition these weight matrices according to half of the rows and half of the columns. And this mostly uh, corresponds to the first half of the neurons and the second half of the neurons uh, in the two hidden layers. Uh, and uh, in this case, we are always assuming that we are dropping out the right half of the neurons. Okay, so let's actually look at this pass. Uh, so here's the first step. Uh, the first step is quite simple. So I have this neural network. I'm going to change the top layer weight to 2L30. So I only keep the left part of the weight and I multiply the weight by a factor of two to compensate. Uh, so obviously in this case, uh, only the top layer weight changes and the two endpoints are both good by the dropout stable assumption. Uh, so the first step is simple. So let's look at the second step. So in the second step, we are not going to do a type B move because now if you look at the right hand side of the top hidden layer, uh, it no longer has any outgoing edges. So I can change its incoming edges arbitrarily, and I change that to two times L2. So these uh, neurons are now going to be connected to first half of the neurons in the next layer. Uh, or just to illustrate it more clearly, uh, these weights and uh, the weight, the incoming edges for these guys and the, these guys are, are totally unrelated parts of the matrix. So you can think that the network now has these two separate components. Uh, one uh, that's giving the current output, one that's preparing for the next step. Okay, so the next step is going to be that we flip the top layer weights from the left hand side to the right hand side. Okay. So why is this okay? Uh, this is okay because one, we are only changing the top layer weight, and two, the two endpoints are going to be both good. Obviously, the first endpoint is good. It was the last point uh, of the previous step. The, se the reason that the second endpoint is good is because it's actually equivalent to this neural network um, with weights 2L3 times 2L2. So basically, it, uh, so this is, equivalent to a dropout version where we drop out both of the right parts. Um, okay, so uh, so that's the third step. Actually, if you are just doing a three layer from here, you can do some further cleanup and the pass is going to be complete. Uh, I'm going to show you more steps as those are required for the induction uh, if you want to go to more layers. So the next step is going to be, okay, so now instead of the right part has no uh, connection. Now the left part does not have any outgoing edges. So I can change the incoming edges of the left part arbitrarily, and I change that to the same thing, two times L2. So, so it's now only connected to the left part of the first hidden layer. Um, and obviously this did, did, didn't change the output, so it's okay. Um, uh, so uh, second to last step, I again switch back from uh, switch from the right part to the left part. Uh, in this case, the two endpoints are actually corresponding to the same uh, network, so uh, so nothing is changing uh, in this uh, in this step. Uh, so this is already the second to the last step. As you can see, after this step, uh, the right part of the top hidden layer has no outgoing edges. The right part of uh, the first hidden layer does not have any outgoing edges. So I can freely change all the incoming edges for both of them. The next step, I'm going to set all of them to zero. So this green part basically disappears from the network. This green part also disappears from the network. And we get this final dropout version of the network. So just by doing these steps, we have connected a three-layer neural network to its dropout version. 
and in every step, we are guaranteed that the loss uh, is bounded by the maximum loss of its two endpoints. Uh, all the endpoints uh, have bounded loss because of dropout stability. So that's how we can do the connection. Uh, it, it's fairly straightforward to actually extend this uh, kind of construction to multiple layers. You just need to do an induction of the number of layers. Uh, so the final result that in the paper that I'm just going to very briefly mention is we can replace uh, dropout stability with uh, noise stability. So at a very high level, we say a network is noise stable if injecting noise at uh, intermediate layers does not change the output by too much. Uh, so the precise definition is a bit messy and it was similar to the definitions that we used before in this paper, which was aiming to prove better generalization bounds for neural networks. Uh, so using the stronger assumption, uh, we are going to be able to show if both parameters are epsilon noise stable, then there is a, a path with a similar guarantee as before. What's slightly stronger here is we can <coughs> prove that the path consists of exactly 10 line segments, so a, a constant number of line segments. Uh, it's possible to improve this number 10, but we also don't have any idea how to improve from 10 to 2. So, uh, so we didn't bother do that, doing that. Um, and uh, in contrast, the previous uh, construction is going to have number of line segments that's proportional to the number of layers. Uh, the main idea here is that noise stability uh, under this definition actually implies dropout stability. And uh, further, it actually implies something stronger. If you have noise stability, you can do direct interpolation between a network and its dropout version. Um, uh, so here are some experimental results. Uh, so these are paths constructed according to the dropout uh, version of the theorem. Uh, so, the, so this is a smaller data set, the MNIST, and uh, also a smaller neural network. As you can see for MNIST, uh, the theorem works very well. Uh, throughout the past, the loss is very low. The accuracy remains high. Uh, the theory is de definitely not perfect. Uh, on CIFAR 10, we are looking at a much larger neural network, VGG11. Um, and uh, in this case, we uh, used dropout training. But even in that case, uh, we cannot construct a very ideal pass. As you can see, the loss does increase in the middle. Uh, and uh, accuracy decreases. Question? Yes. Um, yeah. I'm just asking, what is the x-axis? What does path parameter mean? Do oh, x-axis uh, is just a path parameter t. So think of when t is 0, it's one endpoint. When t is 1, it's another endpoint. And when t is in between, it's all the points along the path. And, and you found the path through the, the We constructed the path uh, oh, basically using the proof that I showed you just path. now. Yes. Oh, well, yes, that's, that's pretty much what I wanted to ask. That. So this is the path that you construct through your proof. So how do you find those 50% in this experiment? Oh, in, uh, in this, uh, uh, in the CIFAR 10 example, we just randomly throw away half of the neurons. OK, so yeah, well, well, uh, that may be why. Well, I mean, we tried to do this repeatedly and pick the better one, but they are actually fairly well concentrated. Uh, we, we might be able to do better by pr pruning these neurons more carefully, but we haven't tried that. And, but what is the middle of the path? What's that? Which, which steps does this correspond to? Oh, well, that's, <laughs> um, so that's basically, uh, so I believe this was actually just, uh, uh, well, in, in some sense, the pass parameter t just doesn't uh, say anything because the pass parameter t, like you can always scale the parameter t. So I think in this case, um, uh, so I'm actually not exactly sure. I think in this case, uh, this middle part uh, is when we, um, uh, when we go to the dropout on the first few layers. So, so the main problem in the experiment is when we apply to dropout to the early layers of the neural network, the, uh, the accuracy significantly uh, decreases. That's right. Um, so I imagine the original papers, I forget the exact details, but I imagine the original papers showing mode connectivity did not use this dropout approach because it didn't exist right. yet. So they did something like so, has a so, 
Right. So the simplest way to actually find these paths in practice is you just parameterize the middle point, uh, the A to B to C, the, oh sorry, A to C to B, you parameterize the middle point and you will optimize a loss function. Yeah, so I guess what I'm wondering about is, um, have you gone back and like looked, at, is there the paths that you find the, uh, the previous like kind of heuristic approaches, are they somehow qualitatively similar to what you uh, they are qualitatively better it is in the CFART case. In, in the MNIST case, I, I mean, they are all kind of similar, but in the CFART case, <laughs> the path there is actually have lower loss in, in, in the... So how many intervals does an average, like, empirically... Well, what? It's just two intervals in the... Interval. Oh, they find it with two. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, definitely there is still a gap from this path versus the path that's actually found. For the CFAR, do you know what the uh, do you know what just the convex line segment plot will look like? Uh, right, that's something that we should try, but we, we haven't done that actually. But uh, if you actually, uh, I, I don't want to go back, but if you go back to the first slide, uh, you can see that that's a, actually an experiment on CFR10, and the direct interpolation has a loss of five or something. Oh, so, way worse. Uh, so, so this is definitely still better than that, but we should probably show a comparison, but. Uh, but the path is not ideal. That's right. So you assume that the two dopamine ones have to have 50% disjoint weights. That is, one of them is with 50% of the nodes. Oh, uh, good question. So, so they, uh, they, they are you are are zeroing out half of the neurons. They don't have to be uh, the matching. Like, it's not that one neuron that you zero out in one has to be uh, not zeroed out the, uh, in the other. They don't have to be aligned. Uh, in the actual proof, we have more steps to say, uh, how do you permute things so that one of them is going to zero out only half of the uh, right half, and one of them is only going to zero out the left half. Uh, so I didn't talk about that step. Oh, OK. So le uh, let me try to wrap up. So a uh, short conclusion for neural networks, uh, maybe not all local or global min are connected. Uh, but we can show that some of them are connected, especially those satisfy dropout stability. So there are many open problems here. So uh, there are obvious ones uh, that we have already <laughs> discussed. Of course, paths that are found by uh, these techniques uh, of our theorems are still more complicated than the paths found in practice. And paths known, are known to exist in practice, even if the solutions are not as dropout stable as we wanted. Uh, but the most, surprise, uh, the most interesting open problem to me is can we leverage this mode connectivity property to design better optimization algorithms, right? So why is this related to optimization? Well, if you think about it, if all local minimum are connected, then all the level sets uh, of the problem, so level sets are just a set of points that are below a certain objective value. So all of the level sets are also connected. So you cannot have this kind of a function. You have to have uh, at least a straight line here. So even if you only have the weaker version, even if only all the typical solutions are connected and there is a typical global minimum, then it, in some sense local search algorithm will not be completely stuck in the sense that even if you are actually stuck, uh, there is actually a path from your point to the global minimizer that's not increasing in objective function value. Uh, so it seems to say that optimization is good, but of course not quite because there can still be flat regions or high order saddle points that we don't know how to deal with. So can we uh, have better optimization algorithm or maybe optimization uh, like gradient descent is not working? Can we have some sampling algorithm like uh, Langevin Monte Carlo that can leverage these kind of properties better? Right? Uh, so that I think is a very interesting open problem. So that's uh, all, thanks. Sorry, so I, I mean for uh, empirically for neural networks, <laughs> if you find the local minimizers using the standard optimization algorithms, uh, then you can use a different algorithm to find a path between these two, these local minimizers such that uh, the entire loss on the path is, is below or is not much higher than the two endpoints. I see, so it's just empirical. Uh, 
Yeah, but what, what we show here is under some assumptions, we can prove that. Um, are, are the two different optimums found? Is it like a, just a different initial? Oh, yeah, so the, in the first uh, slide, the empirical results, uh, those are just two random initializations. And also for your experiment? Yeah, for my experiments, they are also just two uh, random initializations. I guess we are running a little bit late. Uh, I guess this next speaker again.